So today we're going to talk about redesigns, and that word can conjure up a lot of different emotions. For all of the designers out there, when you hear the word redesign, you might react to something like this. <laughs> it is That word is full of big dreams and expansive thinking and that one shot to fix all the problems with your product. But I am a product manager, so I have a slightly different reaction to the word redesign. I look a little bit more like this guy. <laughs> So to me, redesigning can uh, be a total nightmare. Uh, there's impossibly high stakes, there's a constant fear of user backlash, and it's really, really hard to execute well. So what makes redesign so challenging? Pretty much everything is harder. And we'll start with gaining trust and getting buy-in from the rest of your organization. If you've ever worked on a redesign, or even if you've just visited a company that's in the middle of a redesign, you're likely to see a team of designers who have locked themselves away in a room that looks something like this. And there's pictures all over the walls, there's sticky notes, and it's totally a beautiful mind in there. Uh, but the meanwhile, the rest of the organization is just wondering what the hell is going on, and it's really hard for them to trust the process when they have no visibility into it and they're not seeing any signs of progress along the way. But let's say that you have a great reputation and you've earned everyone's trust, so you're able to get buy-in and gain that trust. Your next challenge is going to be making decisions. Redesign work is inherently subjective, which means that you're relying on a lot of people's personal preferences and intuitions to make decisions. So not only does your design team have opinions, but every stakeholder and pretty much anyone across the company can give input and express their opinions on things like choosing the exact right shade of blue. So you end up going round and round on these kinds of calls, and the more people you're working with, the more opinions you have to manage, and it can be really tough to make forward progress. But let's say that you're a dictator and you call all the shots and you're able to make decisions, move quickly, and actually ship your redesign. You're not in the clear yet. You still have to figure out how to measure success. So you've made a bunch of different changes, but you've launched them all at once which means that it's really hard to figure out which changes specifically worked well and which didn't. So in the worst case scenario, your metrics totally tank, then it's really anyone's guess to figure out what went wrong. So uh, you, can, uh, you can imagine why I would be reluctant to get on board with a, re with a redesign. But uh, avoiding one can make your product seem outdated and you run the risk of becoming obsolete over time. These days, you see new redesigns that are popping up every few months. These are headlines from just this past year alone from major redesigns across all different kinds of products. And if they're so challenging, why is it that there's so many? Well, pretty much everything we experience these days happens through a digital interface. Whether you are shopping or managing your finances or even making a doctor's appointment, there is a digital interface for that, and the more digital products there are, the more designers there are out there that are accelerating the evolution of visual styles. So as design trends move faster than ever, as soon as one style rolls out, the previous version looks incredibly outdated by comparison. And you can see here the dramatic shift when iOS moved from skeuomorphic to flat design. So that brings us to the product I work on, which is Asana. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a tool that helps teams uh, track their work. But I am going to actually tell you a little bit about our friend Fred here, who will help you understand what the Asana user experience was like before we redesigned about a year ago. So Fred is a really sweet guy. He's smart. He's there when you need him. Um, but unfortunately, Fred doesn't make friends very easily. Despite his really kind soul, he gives off a pretty awkward first impression. If you introduce him to friends, you're likely to say, give the guy a chance, you're going to learn to love him. Uh, and until the Asana redesign, this is how a lot of people felt about our product. We were giving off a bad first impression, and it was really hard to attract and retain users as a result. So we knew that if we didn't redesign the product, we'd be hindering our, our product and our company's growth in a big way. 
So we, we went ahead and we, we bought in. And to give you a little preview of what we did, we went from this old world to this bright new world. And I'm going to get into how we actually pulled that off. So when I was approaching the execution of a redesign, my first instinct was to break it up. I was, as a product manager, coming at this the same way I would come at building a new feature, where we would start with an MVP, we would A-B test it, and iter iterate our way to an optimized end state. In fact, I could not imagine any, the alternative, which would be you know, going heads down for months, uh, working on new designs until this one big reveal moment where we may find that users absolutely hate it. But our design team had very different instincts. They recognized that the redesign is more than the sum of its parts, and they couldn't imagine launching it piecemeal. Uh, they did not want to put users through this Frankenstein experience where parts of the new style would exist alongside remnants of the old design. They just could not stomach it. So we wondered if there was a way to get the best of both worlds. In order to figure that out, we really took a closer look at the specific user pain points that we were trying to solve, and we recognized from there that there are actually two sets of issues. There are some structural issues, things like broken navigation and a lack of hierarchy, and then there were also visual issues, which were things like outdated button styles and a drab color scheme across all of our platforms. Making this distinction allowed us to see that we could incrementally launch structural improvements in the old visual style without ha having to put users through that Frankenstein experience. Uh, and then once we had made all of the structural changes, we could launch a visual refresh in one big bang. Uh, but we'd be limiting the risk of user backlash because we wouldn't be forcing users to change their entire workflows overnight. So we, we started with this incremental process and to make the structural changes first. And the first step there was to set a general direction. To do this, our design team uh, brainstormed broad possibilities on how to maximize clarity for our end users. Then once they had uh, gone through an exploration phase, they took the best elements of those designs and incorporated them into a concept mock that looked like this. Now, because we were taking an incremental approach, uh, it was a little easier to get consensus on this uh, general vision and also get buy-in from our stakeholders because we knew that we would never actually ship these designs. The details would change and evolve based on the information we were gathering with the incremental steps along the way. That, that lowered the stakes and made it easier for people to avoid circling round and round on things like the right shade of blue. So once we had our general direction, we next had to build the steps to get there. Uh, to do this, we started by breaking up those concept mock designs into all of their independent parts. So for example, one part was a top bar navigation element. We also had a sidebar navigation. And here are all of the different parts that we ended up launching incrementally. Once we knew what these independent parts were, we then had to figure out which ones we wanted to launch first. So we considered what we could learn from each individual piece. If it was a huge departure from the status quo, or if it was a design based on assumptions that we weren't able to test with a prototype or get user feedback on, then we knew we, we had a lot to learn from actually launching it, and we wanted to optimize for getting those insights early on so that we could course correct our way into a better end state over time. So going back to all of the different parts that we launched, these two were the biggest learning opportunities for us. They changed the entire navigation of the web product. Uh, so we tested these first to, to validate our assumptions early. And I've said this a couple times now, but this is really the major advantage of an incremental approach. You get to answer your biggest open questions before making big decisions based on what may be false assumptions and it really mitigates the risk of major catastrophe down the road. But this isn't the only advantage. You also, when you're taking an incremental approach, you get to build momentum along the way. So you're not holed up in a room for months with the beautiful mind thing happening. You can actually ship something, get feedback on it, and, and generate some excitement and, and garner that trust with the rest of the organization. 
So for example, that top bar navigation piece that you saw, that was one of our first launches, and that was a huge success, uh, which really excited the team and, and helped the company to rally around the project in general. So here's, this is just a staff, internal staff announcement when we, when we recognized the win and we're getting comments and love from across the company, which felt really good and allowed us to build momentum in the right direction. Had we bundled this top bar change in with a several others and waited for sort of a big bang launch at the end, we would have gone months without seeing any signs of progress. And that can be really demoralizing and erode that trust. So not all launches went that smoothly. Uh, the top bar win was really great, but we also hit some road bumps. On the other end of the spectrum was a feature uh, a new sidebar navigation, uh, which is something that we prototyped and we dog fooded internally and we beta tested with customers, but we still didn't anticipate what would happen at launch. And it was pretty big bummer. There was a user backlash that ensued almost immediately. Uh, you can see here that there was a lot of outrage on Twitter. We got twice as many uh, support tickets as we would normally get, uh, and the A-B test failed. So this felt pretty terrible at the time, but looking back now, we're really glad that we were able to recognize this loss up front because we had launched it as an independent piece and we were able to see uh, exactly what the problem was and roll back the, the change that was causing all of this negative feedback. Had we bundled this in with everything else in one big redesign, we wouldn't have been able to fix the problem as easily and it would have made the entire project look like a failure or feel like a failure. And then the last advantage of this approach is really knowing when to move on. Uh, so because you can see the impact of each individual piece, you can recognize uh, when you're starting to hit diminishing returns. So as, we, as the launches went further and further down the line, the changes were more subtle and the impacts were more subtle. So we knew that it was time to move on to higher impact work, uh, like the visual refresh. So the visual refresh. In some ways, this is a story about how we went from a logo with three dots to a logo with three dots. <laughs> but there's a lot more under the hood. So even though we were taking a big bang approach where we wanted to launch this uh, with a lot of fanfare and press, we still took an incremental approach to building it and launching it internally. So going back to our process, we set up a general direction, and here you can see uh, what that was after we had gone through an exploration phase. We really let things cross-pollinate across platforms. We were not only uh, reskinning our web product, we were also reskinning our mobile apps and our marketing site, and we let all of the ideas cross-pollinate. Uh, here, which, which can be really dizzying and chaotic, but we sort of embraced that chaos because it opened us up to possibilities we wouldn't have found otherwise. Uh, for example, we pretty late in our exploration phase, we discovered this coral orange color that ended up being our main brand color. And when we uh, landed on it, it felt right, but our web designers didn't necessarily see exactly how it would fit in our UI until a mobile designer had used it as a backsplash in the iOS app. And then from there, we were able to take that cue and sort of uh, ripple it through the web UI in similar ways. So that cross-pollination not only opened us up to new ideas, but it also helped us gain consistency across the platforms. Okay, once we had our vision, again, we needed to break up uh, that vision into incremental steps. So we put together a style guide that maps out all of the changes for the button styles, the menu styles, pop-ups, et cetera. And each element could be built uh, or implemented independently. And then we sequenced through these launches, again, based on uh, the highest impact uh, and the biggest learning opportunities up front. So here you can see a prioritized list that our mobile and web engines moved from the top down on. Uh, and what was nice was the fact that the entire company was dogfooding these changes all along the way. So at the beginning, when we introduced the highest impact changes, like that bright coral orange color, uh, we got a lot of fanfare from across the company. Everyone was really excited and they could feel the, the impact. Um, but as we got through about 75% of that list, 
we realized that uh, we were hitting diminishing returns. We were working on settings dialogues that were hidden in deep in corners of the app. So we knew that we didn't really want to chase these d diminishing returns into perfection. And we agreed that done was better than perfect and it was time to launch. So although we launched the majority of changes incrementally, we were still able to get away with a big bang with the press. Uh, and that we really were motivated to do that because it's a big driver for word of mouth growth and it's an opportunity to reactivate old users. Um, we were able to get away with this because even though we'd basically been rearranging the furniture for months, uh, we were painting the walls, really made it feel like a completely different room. And again, when you're bundling changes, it can be hard to measure. We weren't able to A-B test because we had such a big marketing campaign around the reskin. So instead, we looked at other metrics. For example, we measured the opt-out rate. We gave user, existing users the option to go into the old, or sorry, go into the new design or opt out and return to the old world. Uh, and we had less than a 1% opt-out rate, which we felt pretty uh, excited about. We also did sentiment analysis on Twitter and our blog comments and felt like we got overwhelmingly positive feedback from there. And we received fan art, uh, which we considered the biggest win of all. So that's our story. Thanks so much. I'm going to be sticking around after for questions if you have any.